Yeah. On this week's episode of One Hour Intern, I'll learn from Anne and Mirko. She has graced the cover of Forbes, been called the most powerful woman in startups, is a founding partner at venture capital firm Floodgate, in her spare time, a lecturer at Stanford. And thanks for meeting with me today. Thank you for having me. In this um, COVID world, as a member of the venture world, focusing on startups with such an interesting um, economic situation, can you talk about what you've been doing to continue your work and move forward? Yeah, so um, I, I'm basically stuck at home here in Menlo Park. We're right next to Stanford University near San Francisco. And uh, I have a husband who is also working full time as a CEO of a company. And then I have three kids, ages 13, 11, and nine. And so we are definitely making each other a little bit insane, um, but I bought a ping pong table that I put out outside. And the thing that is nice about ping pong is that if you are on Zoom all day long, staring at the screen, which is exactly the same distance all the time, your eyes just start to get really tired. And so ping pong is fun because the ball is going back and forth in different depths. And so we have been playing a lot of ping pong recently and I would say we've gotten pretty good. And so as a family, I think I'm the worst ping pong player, but even my nine-year-old can do some pretty good spin serves now. Wow, yeah. And with more of a focus on kind of business, what have you been doing to stay productive and yeah. make sure that your company keeps moving forward and that the companies that you're on boards of also continue to move forward? Good question. I think with um, with respect to the, the professional life, um, I, I'm really fortunate in that the work that I do can translate really nicely online. So most of the time, my day involves meeting with different people. It might be meeting with a founder who I've already invested in. It might be meeting with larger companies to understand what they're doing so that I understand who we can sell to, what, what they're interested in, uh, what my companies might be able to do for them. Um, I'm also meeting with new companies and new founders and people who might want to work at new companies. And so all of them was just meeting people. And, and so now um, with Zoom, uh, I can basically meet with all of these people back to back to back. And so it's just been a very efficient use of my time. Um, I don't have to travel to LA. I don't have to travel to New York. Uh, literally from the comfort of my own home, I can meet directly with a founder in LA and in the next hour meet with a founder in New York City. And so there's a, there's a newfound efficiency in my life that I think I've taken advantage of. Um, I think the, the difficult piece is just the, the separation between work and life. Um, I just don't have any of it, right? And so I start working uh, probably sometime between six and eight in the morning. And it doesn't stop until about six or 8 p.m. And so yeah. if I'm not careful, it's just sort of back to back to back all the time, uh, maybe an hour to make lunch for the kids and then and then back to work. And then I have to find some time in there to respond to emails. And sometimes I don't even get to that. Uh, and so the danger is burnout. Um, but the ability to do the work that we need to, that's just been expanded. And in fact, we've been very active in making investments. We know that lots of other firms have been active in investing into our companies and doing follow-on financing. Um, and so, so nothing's really slowed down. And in fact, we would say everything's accelerated. Have you found any particular strategies to, uh, to deal with burnout? Well, part of it is ping pong. Some of it is actually setting boundaries. So I tend to, um, I love reading. And so I will pick up a physical book at nine and I will read for a, an hour or two. And that's actually the time when our kids also sort of gather in the master bedroom. We have a couch in there and beanbag and everyone kind of gets comfortable and reads. Um, 
And that's sort of the time where it just sort of brings me back down and allows me to relax a little bit. Um, but man, I mean, I think with current events and news and election and all of these other things, if you let yourself, you can get pretty stressed out in your downtime too. And so what I'm trying to do is just separate myself away from a lot of that. Yeah, of course, that makes sense. So now let's go back to before, before you were the most successful woman in startups and you were just a Palo Alto native, first generation American, and your father was a rock and scientist at NASA. What were you like as a kid? Um, I think I was just kind of, I was a strange little bird. Um, I was pretty intense. So there are certain things that I just love to do and I didn't really care if other people deemed it cool or not. Um, and if I wanted to do something, I kind of did it. A good example of that, when I was five or six years old, I was I had been playing piano for a couple of years and we went to some sort of community concert. And it's this one of my, my earliest memories. I just remember sitting in the audience and listening to these kids. I think they must've been high school performing on stage. And then there was an intermission and my parents said I disappeared. And in that time I went and I talked to someone, I said, I'd like to perform something too. And, and I was a very shy child, but I loved performing. And so the next thing my parents know, I'm up on stage playing a piece. Um, and so this just sort of, it was just sort of the way I was like, if I wanted to do something, it wasn't that embarrassing to me. Um, and so my, my two things as a kid, I loved piano. And then um, as I went into high school, I developed this like deep passion for speech and debate. I wasn't an af- athletic kid. Um, I wasn't super popular or any of these things. I was just sort of kind of nerdy. Um, and then the things that I liked, I just really liked. So you kind of displayed a contrast in ideas. You were a performer with piano and then did speech and debate, but you said you were really shy. How did you combat that shyness to put yourself on stage and put yourself in front of people? Yeah, um, I think this is a kind of weird dichotomy. Actually performing, so piano, I wasn't shy at all. I um, was shy about public speaking. And actually this was the, the reason that I got into speech and debate in high school was um, I had a moment where I was gonna perform something and. I was on stage and I was so shy that my brother got up on stage and announced my name and announced the piece that I was going to play. And the inner dialogue in my head was like, this is so awkward. This is so weird to have like this person, like my brother announcing my name and saying what piece I'm going to play, but it just seems weird. So I was like, I have to get over this fear. Um, And so it just seemed when I saw the speech and debate team, I didn't like theater. That was just not my thing. So when I saw the speech and debate thing, I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I should try that. And um, joined the team and really liked the, the students who were in that team. And uh, as a result, just sort of stuck around. Yeah. Any tips for people going up on stage who are shy and trying to put themselves out there and perform, whether it's in speech or debate or in music or anything else? Yeah, I I think it's always helpful to start in like smaller intimate circles. So the nice thing about speech and debate was that you didn't have to go like on stage and speak in front of hundreds of people. Like the the tournaments were all you're speaking in front of two people, right? And or three people max. And so it it just gave you a chance to really prepare. So you knew what you were going to be talking about. It wasn't just thrown at you. And you could really about it. And so there was an element of, I'm going to be talking about something, but I know what the subject matter is. And if I prepare, then I'll be okay. And so I started small. And then, you know, as you get better at it, then you can, you end up speaking in front of larger audiences. And so the, the transition was really, really gradual for me. I was a terrible speech and debater for a couple of years. It took me a couple of years to get to a point where I was any good. And so it just gave me the time to warm up to it. I think it's worse if you really like 
if you're really terrified of speaking in public and all of a sudden you you're on you're in theater and you're performing in front of like hundreds of people, I imagine that would be really tough. Yeah, of course. So you had mentioned um your brother had helped you kind of announce yourself and it brings up another question. What was your relationship with your family like and how did that have an effect upon you? Yeah, we were um we're an immigrant family. So my my parents came from Japan. And my dad came out here to get his PhD. My mom came out here to get married to him. And so my brother and I were born here, but we had no relatives in the United States. They were all in Japan. We all spoke Japanese at home. Um, and so we were we were very Japanese in some sense, like respectful of the elders, like uh you know, a lot of emphasis on education in the house. Um, we ate Japanese food at home. And so there's that element. The other piece of the, that's relevant from an immigrant standpoint is that my mom um, kind of didn't know what the system was. And so she kind of discovered it as she was going along. My brother, fortunately, was just like, he was really with it. Like he was social he was you know, a great test taker. So he was always naturally in these like great programs. And I was not a very bad test taker in elementary school. And um, there was a test that you had to take to get into the gifted and talented program. And I, I failed it like almost every year in elementary school. And, and the, the teachers would literally say at this time, like, she is neither gifted or talented. And so she needs to be in this sort of very regular class. And my mother would, bless her heart, every year go to the main office and basically badger the school administrators until they let me into, for just that one year, into the into the gifted and talented program. They would say, okay, we'll let her in for a year, but then she's going to have to test in next year. And then I was horrible at testing, so I would do poorly again. Um, but like that to me was such a, it was such a important message of my mom's like complete belief. And it was to her, she was like, of course she's gifted and talented. Like no test could possibly express like how gifted and how talented she is. And there's like no test for human potential. Like she is human potential, like in the flesh. So you have to take her. Um, and so to have a fan like that early on in your life where someone just believes with no evidence was just unbelievable to me. And then she was also this incredible like adventurer. So um, every, every day was like an adventure. She would, in the summer, she would take us hiking into the hills and it wasn't like just a hike. We'd go into the creeks and she'd make sure we had boots and she'd She'd have like netting and we'd go and like find tadpoles and, you know, little fish and we'd catch them, uh, put them into jars and bring them home. She was into all of that kind of exploratory things, like just the, the discovery when you're a kid, um, she was into that. And so I, I was blessed from that perspective. And then the last way that I think our relationship was just really uh, important was that she pushed and she pushed in ways that mattered. Um, and she always wanted the best. So um, I was living in the South Bay. We were in Palo Alto at the time, um, but the best piano teachers were in San Francisco. And so she would drive my brother and I, my brother played violin all the way to the San Francisco Conservatory every week. And sometimes it was twice a week. Um, and she didn't ever think of it as a sacrifice. She was like, that's just where the best teacher is. And you have to have the best teacher to become the best. And so obviously that's what we would do. And like now as a parent, I, I think of like driving my children twice a week to San Francisco for lessons and it's almost unthinkable. Um, but she made that sacrifice without even thinking about it. And then, you know, when it came to to being good at certain things, it was it was sort of an expectation. So in our family, you were good at math. It wasn't like, 
is she good at math? She was like, you're good at math. And if you didn't get the grades to represent that you were good at math, then you were basically like, you wouldn't come home. So um, it wasn't, it was more than an expectation. It was, this is what you are. Um, and I appreciate that because I think a lot of people talk about how like the belief in yourself can degrade over time because other people don't believe in you. Um, in our family, that was just, or it is what it was. Um, and so that's, that's a relation. My dad was such a, he was such a hard worker and he, um, worked at NASA would leave at five in the morning to go to work. Um, and I would say in many ways he was a workaholic, um, until I was in high school and like I needed, uh, parents needed to judge debate tournaments and he would take every Friday off to go judge these stupid tournaments. I was in Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, and seeing my dad actually make that kind of sacrifice suddenly for me in high school, after just years of like always working so hard, I was, I was really touched by that. Um, and so, you know, it's just like the, the four of us, um, growing up here in California, but that's, that's the nature of our family. How did this dedication and pushing aspect really grow you beyond making you feel comfortable and close to your family? Yeah, I think for me, it was a, it was a expectation that um, I could be really great at things. And I think it, and it wasn't, it wasn't so much. Um, I, I think that the importance of that wasn't, there was never pressure. I never felt and I think for some people, this could become overwhelming, right? Like you could just feel overwhelmed with pressure. But I think with my parents, it came with a certain unconditional love. So it wasn't like I felt like I would fail them if I didn't fulfill these expectations. Some of it was um, that I just always was expected that whatever small thing I did, I had to do it great. And it could be a homework assignment. Um, it could be an essay. It could be the way we wash dishes as chores. Um, it could be, you know, helping my mom out on something. All of those had to be done with a level of care and respect for that job that my, my parents just always expected that. I think that was probably more important than anything else. The expectation that I would be great came from the fact that the work that I did was always going to be a high, high expectation work. Yeah, of course. So now let's jump to the year 1993. Jurassic Park and Mrs. Doubtfire, the biggest movies. Mariah Carey's All the Rage. And gas is only $1.11. Up to this year... What's the biggest struggle you've faced? Yeah, so um, I think I had this struggle of not knowing like my place in in high school and just I think some people like really click in high school. They they get there, they find their crew, they have their friends. They're like good at certain things. They know it. I just was like, I was pretty good at piano. That was pretty obvious. That, though I wasn't so good that I was going to like, you know, win some national competition. Before you, so, go on, before you go on, I have to tell you, that's the exact situation that I'm in. And that's the reason that I'm doing this project. So I can kind of learn that though I don't, I haven't found that step it's possible to be successful not having that step in high school. So. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the problem is also that my brother was one of these people he, he knew. So he was deeply passionate about cars and planes, like fast planes when he was from the time that I could even imagine him, he's an older brother. And so he was so deeply influential in the sense that he knew and even to this day, he worked chassis designs for F1 cars. And so wow. like he never deviated from, I love this thing and I'm going to go do it. 
And to imagine like living in the shadow of that, of like, oh, I don't have something that I love that much. Um, and going into junior year, I was, I was like really bad at the speech and debate thing that I had been doing. I hadn't won a single tournament. My mom at this point is like panicked. She's like, you're spending all of your time doing this one thing that is not bearing any kind of fruit. And maybe you should try something else. And I, mind you, this is my mother who has been my biggest fan my entire life, right? That was a big blow. How and do you do I, I just like, it was something that I just kind of liked, right? And, and I just, I just enjoyed it. And there were people in the team that I really loved and respect. And so I just said to her, you know, I think I just need a, and I need to see if I like love it enough to, to like devote time to it. And so I ended up that summer just spending all this time, like researching and debating myself and like practicing. And uh, when I came back, because I'd spent all this time, I was suddenly pretty good at it. And that shift was like really kind of sudden. And it was this reminder to me that, oh, like if I actually like something, I'll actually spend a lot of time doing it, which means that I can get better at it. Um, and if I try to do something that I don't like, it's just harder, right? And so to me, it became all about, and the, the other lesson was, she does not know what I like. She cannot figure, she cannot help me figure it out. Cause she was like, maybe you should try fencing. That was her, that was her solution. And I'm like, I would have been a terrible fencer. Um, yeah. Have you ever tried fencing no. now? No. I, we do like, uh, my kids are super into Star Wars. So I've made lightsabers out of pool noodles and we do uh, lightsaber battles with those. Um, and when I'm against a nine-year-old, I'm pretty good. Uh, but he's not trained in fencing. Um, but I just, I just couldn't imagine, like, I'm not that athletic. So I'm like, this is like the worst suggestion she could make. So it was a lesson to me of like, oh, I know what I can get good at because I might find something that I'm interested in, and because I'm interested, I'll work hard at it and I'll become good at it. Yeah. Um, but like from a career standpoint, like it, I think the struggle then was, I still don't really know what I want to do with my life. Here's my older brother who like knows what he wants to do with his life. And I don't. And so like my life for a while was just sort of free floating and just kind of like trying to discover the things that I'm good at. What does that mean? Who am I? And like, where does that lead me? So then in 1998, when you went to Yale, you got a engineering degree in electrical engineering, a very specific path. That's kind of a big jump from not really knowing what you want to do to taking something super specific. How did you make that transition? It was actually kind of a random journey. So I, I thought I was going to be in, I wanted to go to med school, but I really liked math. I was very good at math always. Um, and, and so I was thinking if I'm going to go to med school, I might study, there's this major called microbiology. So I was like, that, that part, that's kind of med medical school-ish. So maybe that's what I ought to take. Well, it turned out there's not enough math requirements there. I was, I would have fulfilled all of it in high school. And so I was like bummed out about that. And, um, and I read about micro robotics at the time. And there's this vision that one day you would have like these nano robots injected into your veins and then surgically fix everything. And I was just like caught, caught, like my imagination was caught by this idea. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. Like, that's what I want to work on. So just through that, that idea, I was like, okay, well then that's electrical engineering. It turns out that's not really electrical engineering, but it was a, it was an interesting major I did actually really like robotics. And part of the reason was I worked with large robots, um, but I never fell in love with computer programming until like I programmed these robots. We were playing, we were doing um, soccer playing, autonomous soccer playing robots. And I was in charge of the goalie. Hmm. 
when this when we kick the ball in the direction of the goalie and the goalie using its cameras saw the ball coming in its way and it moved its body to block the ball. I was like, oh, that's computer program. That's so awesome. Like you can actually see it responding in the way that I thought it would. Um, and until that moment, I had not really enjoyed it. And I suddenly like developed this real appreciation for it. And so there was like something about, I don't know, that major where it was sort of a full manifestation of programming um, that I really enjoyed. And so that was the, it was kind of a random reason to, to major in it, but it made me, uh, it made me sort of curious about that. Yeah. Throughout your college experience and also your high school experience, were there any other pivotal moments where you really learned an important lesson or a new idea that you wanted to follow? Yeah. So um, the most important moment in my college life was um, I actually worked in the uh, Dean of Engineering's office and uh, it was part of my work study. So part of my financial aid was you have to work for, I can't remember, six to 10 hours a week. And um And there's like this board where you go in and you see all these different types of jobs. One was like refilling formaldehyde levels in biology labs for like specimens. And I was like, I don't want to do that. And then the next one was filing um, in the office of the Dean of Engineering. So I went in and interviewed for that, got the job. And again, my dad was always like, you have to be like really world-class at this job. And I remember saying, oh my gosh, dad, like this is like, I'm not even going to interface with any of the important people. I'm just like filing in some room. And I got in there and this, the, the executive assistant, her name was Sarah Scubas. She was just so wonderful. She became almost like my mom when I was in college, but I just loved working for her. So no matter what she asked me to do, I would try to do it better, more efficiently. And I really cared about that job. And so she used to sing my praises to the Dean of Engineering, who was this old, very gruff guy. And this guy one day appears from his office and he's like, what's your name? And I said, I'm Ann Mira. And he said, I have a dear friend here. I need some student to give him a tour of the campus. Can you do that right now? It was working. So I said, sure, I can do that. So I I take this guy on a tour of the engineering department. And it turns out he's from Palo Alto too. And we're just having this great conversation. And at the end, he's like, you know, what are you doing for spring break? And I said, I'm about to go home, uh, visit my parents. And he said, that's great. If you want, like, you can come see what I do at work. And I said, And he turns around, he's like, I'm the CEO of Hewlett Packard. And and Hewlett Packard at the time was probably like a Fortune 50 company. It was one of the the biggest companies in Silicon Valley. And so I ended up during my spring break basically shadowing him. And when I returned back to school, he had sent me two pictures. One was just a picture of this guy, Lou Platt, sitting in a chair and I'm talking to him. And the next picture was Lou Platt sitting in that same chair. And then Bill Gates was sitting exactly where I had sat. Wow. And to me, that was like, no one had ever said, hey, like you could be like Bill Gates. But like Lou Platt in that moment had just planted this little tiny seed of, Like, what do you want to do in the future? Like, what's your biggest dream? And, and like, he had taken like someone he doesn't even know, just like a random who gave him a tour of the campus, gives, gives her this shot at like developing a dream. And to me, like that was, it was so life-changing in a, the, the manifestation of like mentorship means it's like, you take someone who doesn't know what potential actually is and you you literally translate it for them. But all, like, for me, it was life-changing because 
it did expand my mind in terms of, okay, after school, like, what will I do? What will I just be a research scientist? Is that what I want to do? Um, because that was where I was headed. I was like, I like science. I'll just work for the government. I'll work at, at a lab. Um, and it turned into, I could do business. Like I could, I could build a company, I could be a part of that economy. And it just shifted everything inside of me. And, and I remember from that moment on, I was all about like, well, what am I going to build and who am I going to become? And with that, like everything changed. So now that we're at that turning point in your life, let's go to the, the break segment called the coffee break, where you can tell a embarrassing or funny story from your life. Does anything in particular come to mind? Yeah, when you're talking about it, I um, it it reminded me of the the story when we were getting our picture taken for Forbes. So there is this um, I was part of this group called All Raise that was getting a lot more women into venture capital, and Forbes decided to write an article about this, and they wanted to take some pictures of the women who were involved, and. At first, I was thinking maybe I won't go because I was all the way down in Palo Alto. It would have taken me an hour to get back up to San Francisco. But a friend of mine, like a really good friend of mine said, you know, you should just, you should go. This is important. And so I went into my closet, grabbed a shirt because they said it had to be like a single colored shirt. And I, I decided at the last minute, I wouldn't drive, that I would just take the train up. And so... I got on the train and, and I was starting to get worried that I was going to be late to this picture taking session. And sure enough, I was, but I was like, oh, there's like so many women having their picture taken. There'll be group shots. It, it's fine if I'm like 30 minutes late to this like two hour session. Um, and, and so I get to San Francisco and then I'm, um, I decide like I'm going to actually take a lift but not, not just even a, a, a regular lift. It said that I'll save $6 if I take the shared lift ride. So I get into a shared lift and it starts basically taking us, but it's a lot slower. And now by that point, like I have several of the venture capitalists plus the journalist calling to see where I am because they're waiting to take the group photo. And, and they're like, where, where are you? And I had to confess, I'm, like, I'm in a, I'm in a shared lift ride. We have like two more stops to give before, like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be there. And they're like, why would you even take a shared lift ride? If you are a venture capitalist, I'm like, because I could save $6 <laughs> and then I get there and not only is everyone, and I had no idea it was going to be such a big deal. They had not said that this was for the cover shoot, but I get there and I realize, oh, this is much bigger than I thought it was going to be. And the, there's people who are doing makeup and hair and everything. And they're in such a rush to get me in. They, they like pull someone else out of a chair, put me in. And the woman is like, she's looking at me and she's kind of like, this is hopeless but she's desperately just like kind of trying to do my hair, kind of trying to do my, my makeup. And then a third person comes along and they're like, she has food on her shirt. And they literally like have a food stain on my shirt for the picture that they're going to take for the cover of Forbes. And I was like, this is such a disaster. Not only was I 30 minutes late, I have food on my shirt. I barely can get through makeup and hair and Everyone was staring at me when I walked in that door. And they all knew that it was too cheap to take a regular lift. They had taken a train that would make me 30 minutes late to this thing. To this day, wow. like the, the reporter who is in charge of that still gives me a lot of grief about it. <laughs> That's funny. So now back to the, uh, the chronological order of your story. 
after Yale University, you went to get your PhD at Stanford in math modeling and computer science. Why was that the path that you decided to take? Um, so I, I worked for five years and I, um, in like the fourth year when I was working, I had actually already applied to go to law school. This is going back to my speech and debate. Like I was pretty good at it. I thought that maybe that's what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Um, and then I had deep regret. I had a bunch of friends who were in law school and I realized that it wasn't, it wasn't for me. Um, I'm not, not so detail oriented and I like more big picture thinking. And then law, like you really have to care about every word, every semicolon, like what, what is said and what is not said. And that just, that kind of thinking is not my strong suit. So, um, and then, and then the question was like, well, do I go back to more of my technical roots or do I really explore the business side? And there was this business idea that I had, which was that cybersecurity was becoming more interesting. That at the time that I was starting my PhD, it was more like vandalism. People were coming in and vandalizing sites. But you could tell that pretty soon people could make money off of that vandalism. What I didn't know that it would was that it would become nation state warfare. Um, but it would become a bigger and bigger deal. That was that part was pretty clear. And so I believed at the time that there would be companies formed around this idea of cybersecurity and how would you really protect things. And how would you spend money? Like, how would you allocate the money that you're going to spend? Because you couldn't protect everything. And uh, and so I decided in order to start that company, I need to need to study it a little bit better. And so went back to get my PhD at the time. Um, and I was fortunate because at Stanford, there are people who are starting businesses. There are people who are doing research. There's just like lots of different types of people who are there at the same time. Uh, and so I got to meet a lot of different types of people, uh, including entrepreneurs, professors who are entrepreneurs, um, people who are venture capitalists. And, um, and I got an opportunity to not only teach, but do research um, and sort of discover an opportunity for myself that, that went beyond the walls of Stanford. Yeah. You've shown kind of a trend of stopping and pivoting and kind of taking different paths throughout your life, you know, deciding that you wanted to follow the, or take the MCAT, but then pivoting and going towards law. And then, as you said here, pivoting and going towards a cybersecurity, more technical focused, but also business minded idea. How did you yeah. know when it was time to make the pivot? Oh, I'm not sure you ever really do. I think for me, it was, um, there was just something that was interesting to me. And, um, and so I would move in that direction because it was, it was fundamentally interesting. I don't think I, I ever said like in the design of my life, this is going to be advantageous. Uh, and I've seen some people make their life choices that way. But for me, that just doesn't work. I, I just need to, to be more authentic to my current state of mind and, and the people that I want to be around and the things that I want to do. Um, when I was looking at the offer to, to go to Stanford, there was this sort of competing opportunity to potentially work at a place like Google. So Google was in 2003 pre IPO and a bunch of my friends had gone to work there. And there's this question like, should I go there instead? And I remember thinking, I oh, like financially, it makes a lot more sense to go there. Like, getting a PhD, you get paid $25,000 a year. And um, at, at a Google, you would have been paid easily six figures. And so it, it just was like, what am I doing? Um, but at the same time, like I remember explaining it to my husband, explaining it to my friends, like there's just something that I, I want to do. And, and I had some people say, if it's what you want to do, it's what you should do. Uh, and there wasn't a high pressure for me to explain it. And so I was appreciative of that. And I just got to go do what was what I wanted to do. Yeah, of course, that makes sense. 
But, and then during that experience where you were getting your PhD, you kind of started to have a big break in, um, in venture capital with your work with Floodgate. Can you talk about that experience and when that big break was and what it was like? Yeah, so in 2007, I was starting to think about starting this company. So there's cybersecurity. I was about to, I was thinking about graduating within the next couple of years. And so I popped my head up and I was like, what does it mean? Like, should I, should I start a company? And I had a couple of really trusted mentors and advisors. And some of them said, you know, Anne, you've been, you've been in grad school for so long. Why don't you find someone who is actually actively investing in startups? And go talk to them and go see what they're seeing. And there was a guy, Mike Maples, who was in one of my classes. And I just reached out to him and I said, look, I'm just wondering if I can look at the companies that you're looking at. And this is kind of a weird request, but it would just help me with my career path. And, and he was just so generous. He just opened up his deal flow. And every Wednesday, we look at companies together. And and. As we were doing it, there was this point in time where he said, you know, I think I've just turned this into a real venture capital firm. I've been investing mostly my own capital, but I now have other people who want to invest in me. And if you want to do it, like you can be my co-founder and we can define the culture together. We can make this what we want it to be. And it was just this incredible sell from like an incredible talent. He's just like, he's one of the most talented people I've ever met. And so the opportunity to work with him coupled with new way of designing venture capital was really exciting. So at the time you would sell 50% of your company for $5 million. And we were proposing, don't sell that much of your company for $5 million. You don't need $5 million. Sell, sell 10% for $500,000. And we could convince people to do that and because they didn't need the capital anymore. And so we found this hole and we just started to, to exploit it. And um, we got into some really great companies. And it was a really interesting period in my life because I actually had an 18 month old when I started Floodgate. I was pregnant with my second child within a few months. And I had also decided that I was gonna finish the PhD. Um, and so I, in the process of finishing the PhD, I, I had to defend it basically six months or six weeks after I gave birth to my son. Wow. Oops. And so um, I just, uh, it, it was an interesting period where I was so busy with so many different things, but ultimately like everything kind of fell into place. And that was year one, I invested in TaskRabbit, Year two, I invested in Lyft and like the rest of it was sort of off to the races right after that. So there are so many more questions to ask in, but so little time now as you have to run it for. So I just want to zoom out and ask you some bigger picture, bigger picture questions. Thinking yeah. through your entire life's experience, have there been any moments of failure that have been really important to you? And if so, how have you dealt with them? Yeah, I think um, I'll tell you about a, a, a few things where we made some really big misses. So in venture capital, some of the most important, it's not just the deals that you see, but some the important misses that you have that you have to really think about. So what are some companies that I've passed on that have become incredible businesses? Passed on Airbnb. You know, Brian Chesky came and pitched uh, both Mike and me. I think it was in 2009. It was um, it was really early in their business. It was when they were called Air Bed and Breakfast. Um, and we passed because we just believed that it was too, like there's too many dangerous situations, right? Why would... And these companies don't look the way they do when they're at scale. So Airbnb, Airbed and Breakfast, you literally were renting out airbeds in people's homes, mostly in their living room. You didn't get a you know, bed or a room to yourself. It was living room, airbed. 
Um, and so sort of like you look at that, how big is that market? Uh, it turns out you have to like dream about what the future could look like. It's not just what it is today. It's what is, where, where is this going to be? Not just in a year, but 10 years from now, if everything goes well. We passed on Pinterest. Um, similar reason, like when, when I saw it, it was an all-male founding team. So the use cases that they had were like electronics equipment, maybe some like furniture, but it wasn't what it is today, mostly a female use case. Not and not as visually inclined as it is today. And so when I looked at it, it was just a collection of lots of different things. And I thought, oh, it's interesting, but it's hard to tell what it will be. And so I passed. Um, and so I think like for me, those failures where you you don't see something in in what the company can become, they'll haunt you for the rest of your life because they they're the ones that can make you incredibly wildly successful as an angel investor. And uh, there's probably, you know, 10 more of those that I can mention, but those two in particular, I go back to quite a bit. My audio, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. For a second, my audio just completely cut out. <laughs> okay. Is there any other, are there any other big failure moments that, come to mind when thinking about your life that kind of really shaped who you are? Um, I think, you know, the, the other one that I would talk about is, um, I it, like first year in my, my very first test at Yale, I was taking this, um, chemistry exam. It was, a uh, it was in physical chemistry and I still remember it to this day. It was like a very, very hard class. But when you first get to college and you, you've you done well in high school, you just assume you're going to do well in whatever environment you're in. And I, I just kind of assumed I was academically strong. And so I was taking this kind of hard physical chemistry class with a bunch of other freshmen. And in that first test, I kind of realized like, I was not the smartest person in the room. Like I wasn't by far. And when I got the test back, I was, I had done so badly that the professor felt badly for me and didn't even put me on the curve. So I'm looking at my test and I'm like, he has a low grade and the high grade. I'm not even the low grade that he's even mentioning. Um, and I remember feeling like when that's like your first test, I felt like, well, maybe I don't belong here. Right? Maybe, maybe I'm actually totally not qualified to be at this university studying anything. And um, my first reaction was to cry. I called my parents and my dad was like, you know, you should, you should go talk to the professor you probably need to study harder. Um, and, and you should, like, it's a different kind of studying now, right? And so when I was studying, I was so good at studying for the system. Like, I'm really good at studying for the test, right? And, and that's what I had been, like, I was good at this. And it, the machine suddenly changed. And it was about what did I know? And if you were studying for the test, then sometimes they would ask you about stuff you, you might not know because you had studied for the problems that would be on the test. And that was a really hard learning for me. I, it took a lot to crawl out of that hole, both from a confidence standpoint, but also from, from a, just a grade standpoint. Like if you feel like you're about to get an F in a class and it's the first class you've ever taken, um, that's, that's a real shakeup. I just, um, my reaction to that though was, I think that was what was important. I didn't just sort of crawl into a hole and give up. I think it created like this fight feeling in me. Like I'm going to prove to these people that I belong. I'm going to prove to myself. I'm going to prove to the other students. I'm going to prove to my professor 
that I deserve this spot. Yeah. And I fought like hell for that class. Like I went and found tutors who would help me explain things to me. I went to office hours. I like badgered the professor to explain things to me more than once. I took notes. Like I asked other students. I was shameless in just trying to get to knowledge. And um, it taught me a lot about pride. It taught me a lot about effort. It taught me about what it means to actually study something and not just try to get a good good outcome. Um, and it a lot of humility because uh, I realized I'm not naturally smart. I'm like, I'm good at process and I'm good at certain things, but I have to work like hell to yeah. be good at some things. Um, and I learned that lesson through that, that big failure. And like, I never again, did I want to be off the charts when it came to being on the opposite end of the curve? Yeah, of course. So my second to last question will be now that you have reached a pinnacle of success in your life, how will you define success? Oh, I don't think that I've reached the pinnacle of success for me. Like every day is a journey. I love finding new companies and new entrepreneurs who are building interesting things. And, uh, and, and most of the time, because I'm working with them in the first two, three years of their existence, um, it's silly. Right. And even when we, even when we get our next round of financing, it's still really early. And so um, every day it's like you wake up in the morning and you're starting all over again. So the day that um, Lyft had their IPO, uh, it was really early in the morning. And so we basically all had breakfast together and we had this IPO in LA. And then most people like got on to a plane and went home. And I basically got into a lift and I drove to a restaurant where I was meeting with a new founder who just started his business and we were going to hash out the product. And, and that's, that's like, that's an early stage investing. And that's like what it is to be in the fight. Right. And it's like going back to that version of myself who had just gotten an F in my first PCAM test. Like every day is a new proof point that I can do this job. Um, and that's what excites me. And it's what gets me up in the morning and, you know, it's, it's a gamble every day. And so that's what, that's what I, I enjoy. Yeah. So finally, thank you for your time. Uh, at the end of each uh, interview, I like to do a segment called the PowerPoints where you kind of give three bullet points or three main ideas from your life experience that help contribute to who you are. Uh, what would those three takeaways be? Um, I would say number one, in everything that you do, try to bring your like most awesome self to that job. The, the second is actually related and it's a different way of thinking about that first point, which is always think like an owner. Don't be an employee. If you own something, it means like there's no job that is too small for you or too beneath you to do. You will do it all because you own it. Um, and if you do that, then you'll make the people around you better and you will be better. And I think the third is always have humility. Um, I think that in building up great teams, in uh, in working with people, uh, the most important thing is to always remember that you can make mistakes, that you can always be better. And if you approach life like that, then you will always get to learn. And I think the key to that is humility. Great. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Thank you. Bye.